Hey, this is Cody, and welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum in the beautiful Cadence Independent Media Studios. Uh, we have been on kind of a bass drum kick lately, talking about hacks and tricks and tuning things and muffling things and everything else. And today, I am introducing the newest member of my drum family. This thing is like driving a Cadillac after my other drums, which are all great, but they're all small. And I got to a point where I was like, man, there's just like not enough rock <laughs> in my house and I want something ridiculous. And uh, Craigslist is a great place to go to find the ridiculous for uh, affordable amounts of money. GMS made them a few years ago. Uh, they're a Long Island company and they make drums on Long Island about half an hour from us. Excellent maple drums. And this one is no exception. Right now, we have it rigged up with an EQ4 clear batter uh, by Evans, and then the Rezo that comes with that when you buy the pack. That's what he had on it when I got it from him. Um, basically unplayed, and there's nothing in the drum right now. And this is kind of just like pure rock. It's a big sound, but it's also kind of controllable, surprisingly controllable, actually. I just wanted to talk today about some of the sort of myths and misconceptions about sort of oversized bass drums like this, which were actually really common in the swing era and early 20th century uh, because they were converted military drums that people wore in front of them. And, you know, these are actually really usable instruments in a lot of different ways. So first of all, let's talk about dimensions. When you're buying a kit that's sort of like a, a box thing, since the 90s, it's been 22 inch bass drums largely. A lot of 20s also, but I feel like 22 is the most common. My first kit was a 22, my second one was, my third one was, it's just what was around, it's what people were using. And the thing that was different about those drums is they were deeper. They were mostly 16, 18, uh, I haven't had one, but I've seen 20 inch deep bass drums. And I always found that the deeper the drum went, the more I struggled to play it effectively. Like, I couldn't figure out why it would feel sluggish, kind of regardless of the diameter. And knowing what I know now about the physics of the two membranes interacting with each other, I realized that, especially as the diameter goes up, bringing the shell depth in allows the air from the batter to reach the rezzo quicker and come back to interact. So you feel like you're in contact with the front of the drum when you play it, whether it's muffled and you're burying the beater, or if it's wide open and you're bouncing it off, everything in between, that depth is actually kind of a big deal. And the physics of a drum with this kind of diameter is such that if this was 18 or 20 inches deep, uh, you know, the, the air hitting the front of the head will not have caught up with what you're doing by the time you want to hit the drum again. So uh, luckily this drum was the size that I was after, 14 deep and 24 in diameter. And it is delightfully controllable, but makes a massive sound. And especially if you're just like doing the ACDC thing and pounding out two and four, this is a really satisfying instrument to smash into. And right now it's, it's tuned up a little bit with nothing in it. And the reason why I did that is because another benefit of this diameter is that you can pitch the head at a given pitch that you like, but the tension will be higher than if you went for the same pitch on a 22 or a 20 because of the larger diameter. So this pitch range is the same as I would probably want out of a 22, but the head is a little tighter, which means that you get quicker response, you get more rebound. And when you dig into it, especially when it's unmuffled, it throws a ton of sound because you're not just hitting a slack head. It's actually got some tension on it. And it the note blooms almost like a tom or something like that, or like a concert bass drum. Now these are uh, slightly pre-muffled heads. There are small mylar muffling rings affixed to the insides of both the front and rear heads here. So that means there's a little bit of control of the overtones, but nevertheless, the note and the tone of the drum is massive, uh, even with the ported front head as this one has. Also, as with the previous bass drum videos that we've been working on, we've added a D112 to the front of the bass drum out the port, and that is to give you an accurate representation of both how it sounds where my head is with the 414 and how it's gonna sound when the house engineer or whoever's working at the studio that you're at puts a mic in the bass drum. Because that's important. The sound where you're sitting and the sound in the front are not the same. Necessarily, they're not the same. So this is gonna give you kind of a blend of both and we'll sort of mix and match them so you can hear 
how they go together. It's pretty ridiculous in this in this studio. <laughs> um, so this really feels like a Zeppelin record to me, hitting it that way, especially with the sort of wide open sound, uh, which I can't help smiling <laughs> when I do it because I've never had a bass drum this big before. Um, I've, the 22 is the biggest that I've ever had. And it's really a blast to feel that air um, moving and hitting you in the chest when you hit it. It's really, uh, it's profound. And this this particular drum has thin maple shells, so there's also a lot of sound coming out of the sides. The shell is definitely resonating, as we talked about in the earlier bass drum videos. And rather than going through a lot of tuning schemes, I just want to talk about how um, large drums, I think a lot of people are a little bit skeptical of how versatile they are and what necessarily they would use them for when a 20 or a 22 feels more versatile. And at this point for me, I feel like I really love 18s because I live in New York and I play a lot of small places and I take 18s around a lot because they fit like in the trunk of a cab. And I also like really big bass drum sounds. And for me, I think that I like a 24 more than a 22 because it's sort of like full commitment to the giant sound. And a 20 is a nice middle ground where you can get it up for bop and you can also get kind of a big sound out of it. I don't really use 22 so much anymore because I feel like they do one contemporary thing that I can pretty much get with a 20. And I think I can also get with a 24, though it'll be a, a larger version of that, that kind of statement. Being a shallower drum like this, it also feels like I can play quickly on it if I want to do fast fills, things like that. Um, there are certainly plenty of people doing progressive stuff, you know, on 24 as there always have been. So it seems like certainly an instrument that can do a lot of stuff. I want to try a couple of different tunings with this just quickly, but it's mostly going to be about muffling because a little bit of muffling is really not going to do a whole lot with a drum this size. It's going to change it a little bit, but you know, putting a towel in between the batter head and the pedal isn't really going to do much to this kind of real estate. So we have to go a little bit further than that. And we're going to start uh, with just a, an Evans uh, EQ pad because the previous owner gave me one to come with this. If you've seen these in the previous videos about the bass drum stuff, probably um, these are great and I haven't used one very much, but it definitely has a good effect on this drum. So we're just gonna put it inside and have it kind of lightly touch both of the heads. All right, EQ pad inside of the drum, gently touching both of the heads, identical tuning to before. It's a good sound. It's growly. It's a little more controlled. Um, but again, th those little pads are not a lot of weight or space against the head. So it's still got a big sound and it's got tone in it still. Um, we could put a big pillow in there. Um, but I think what I'm going to do now that that's in there is try adjusting the tuning a little bit. So let's find out where we're at with these notes for starters. In the earlier video about the 22 inch bass drum, we experimented with 
the batter head just above a wrinkle, which is sort of a scheme that people talk about a lot for rock and pop stuff for having a really punchy sound with, you know, a buried beater and just like driving the pocket and then adjusting the front head based on the room and the tone that you want to have come out of it. Right now, this batter head's pitched up a fair amount. So I'm going to take the batter head down, I don't know, like half a turn. And I think I will leave the rezzo alone for now because it's kind of, it's already on the low side. And we're gonna see what this does and then we might fuss with the front head a little bit. This is ridiculously punchy and it really sounds great. It definitely is not giving me as much rebound, but it does sound great. It feels pretty good. This is getting into the realm, however, that we talked about also in earlier videos where the head is so low that its resonance is not enough to get the shell resonating the way that it was a minute ago. And that means that the sound on this axis from front to back is still pretty strong, but there's not much sound on this axis and this is not so much of a live issue, but I think for recording stuff, or if you just want a big sound in general, tuning your drums in such a way that the shell itself resonates is crucial. It's, I mean, if you're thinking about the kind of bass drum sound you want in room mics or overheads, or just along the stage to spread out a big low sound, uh, tuning a little bit higher so that the shell becomes activated will make the head speak to each other more and it'll make it so that the drum sounds the same everywhere around it. And I, I really, I tell people, experiment with your drum, have somebody else hit it or just move your head around while you're hitting it and see if it sounds the same above the drum or next to it or across the room as it does where you're sitting. And then experiment with tuning schemes, which will be maybe higher than you're used to a little bit and see about getting more out of the drum itself because that's also where if you have drums that you like or if you maybe you know paid a fair amount of money for your kit because it's a quality kit uh tuning it so that the kit is allowed to speak i mean that's the whole reason that it's there that's why you have the bearing edges that you have the particular shell thickness the plies what the kind of wood it's made out of it's got to move or else it may as well it doesn't matter okay so with this bananas low tuning I'm gonna to go to the front head now and I'm gonna pitch it up and see what happens when we leave this alone and try to put some of the work on the front head to activate the drum. So we're still gonna be throwing this low slap forward, but we're gonna to try to get the front head to work a little harder to give us more of the resonance back. All right, this experiment was raising the front head about a quarter turn, and it did affect the sound. It wasn't as dramatic as I was expecting, but this is kind of my experimentation day too. I haven't really gotten to play this drum much yet. Um, to me now, it feels a little more tonal and actually seems like it has a little bit more attack than it did before, or at least it's throwing the attack a little more. And the shell is resonating a little bit more. And for just kind of a final test, frankly, because I'm curious, I'm gonna take the batter, past where it was when we started. I went down a half turn. I'm gonna go over a half up, like three quarters, something like that.
still sounds massive. Doesn't sound like it's tuned super high. It is super affecting the shell now. The whole drum is resonating and it sounds the same here as it does to the side. It sounds even bigger out front, but most importantly, it doesn't sound papery to the sides. It's tone and resonance and fatness everywhere that you go. And if you do this and you get your shell moving, even if you put a big pillow in there and really aggressively muffle the drum, it's going to be a more robust sound than if you have the heads not interacting with the shell at all. And all this really means is that there's enough tension so that when the head vibrates, the shell receives that vibration, sends it across, comes back, comes back, comes back again. And this doesn't have to be a boomy sound. Again, like if you put towels or blankets or, or pillows in there, the shell activating is gonna get you a bigger sound. And no matter the size of your drum, if it's a monster like this, or if it's a little 18 or anything in between, the resonance is everything. And you can always take some of that away, but you can't put it back, you know, unless people start compressing and EQing and maybe even sound replacing or sound reinforcing your drums digitally. And, you know, at this point, it's too easy to do that. And a lot of the sounds that we hear on the radio and on you know whatever video you find online have been modified anywhere from a little all the way to where you're not even hearing what they did. And at this point, it's difficult to know what you're actually hearing. So for your acoustic scenario, get into getting it as fat and as loud and as big as possible and then work back from there rather than trying to take a little thing or an okay thing and build it up later. Thanks so much for watching this installment of our Bass Drum Symposium. And please like, comment, subscribe. Uh, let us know which one of the bass drums was your favorite or if you had a favorite sound that came out of this one and let us know what you're using. We're always curious. You know, it's, it looks like we have a lot of drums around here, but there's a lot of drums in the world and we're fascinated by all of them. Thank you.